morning, church. Today's scripture reading will be found in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 11. Sorry, chapter 13. Chapter 13, John chapter 13, verses 3 through 11. And the word says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean though not every one of you, for he knew he was going, who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not everyone was clean. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. What a great time to be able to worship here. Uh, I just am really excited to be part of this church because of Mission Sunday, because of the way in which you guys respond. Uh, and don't worry, they'll find a lot more things to be able to do with uh, extra funds. We never have a shortage of work. And so that's just one of those things. Uh, and as soon as we find the ox, we can get this cart out of my way. <laughs> but uh, so you guys be on the lookout for that. Uh, but that was a very exciting last week just to be able to see all the things that are going on. And those go on all year long, and you have no idea for the most part that those things are happening. I want to talk about sharing Jesus today and what that really means to be able to share Jesus. Um, the passage that we've read may not seem like it's part of that, but it really is. Jesus talks about here when he knew certain things, he knew everything was put under his feet. He knew he came from God. He knew he was going back to God. And those things are important. It was then that he got the towel, then that he wrapped it around himself, and then that he decided, I'm going to wash the disciples' feet. It was a very important thing for him to be able to do this. And he makes it very symbolic. He makes it not only is it needed at the time, and we always talk about his service, but there's a very important phrase in this passage as you begin to look at what's going on with the passage. Uh, Peter asked, well, are you going to wash my feet? And his really answer is, no, you're not going to wash my feet. I won't let you. You will never wash my feet. And so that seems to be Peter's idea on the whole thing. Uh, you don't need to wash me, I need to serve you. And uh, that seems to be a lot of the way in which we look at this. Jesus is so great, Jesus is so high and holy, and we have this order about us. We recognize some people are above us and over us, and we want to be one of those. Uh, that's a lot of what happens. But Jesus is one that's over everything, is the one who says, I'll wash your feet. Peter objects to that. How can somebody who's over me, higher than me, son of God, wash my feet? And Jesus says it works like this. You don't have a part with me unless I do that. And so it's being able to understand what it means to be part of each other. Part of each other is not about the hierarchy. It's not about who's in charge. Being part of each other is about the emotion and the passion and the way in which we understand each other and what we know about each other. And so that seems to be more what he's describing here as being part with him. 
And so Peter objects to all of this. He says, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus says, this is a requirement. If I don't wash your feet, you don't have part with me. Because this is a cleansing that takes place. It isn't a wish. It's I will wash your feet. And it's feet for now. Later, the washing is in the blood of Christ. And we recognize that. But Jesus uses this as a symbolic time to say, I'm the one that cleanses you. And I'm the one that cleanses the worst, dirtiest part of you. And for them, after they'd been walking all day, uh, he says, that's the worst, dirtiest part of you. Because your feet stink. Your feet are dirty. And I'm the one that does this. And so in order to get them to understand the cleansing that Jesus has, I think it's important that he follows through with this. We understand what this means for us. We understand Jesus cleanses us. He cleanses us because of his blood and because of our baptism into him. We're washed in the water as we are baptized into Christ. And we recognize and understand that Jesus is the one who is cleansing, in order to make us part of him. And that's what this passage is really dealing with. Without that, we're not part of him. Now, Peter can say, no, I don't want you washing me. Jesus is always there to offer. He's always willing to do this. And we can refuse. And a lot of people today do refuse. Say, no, I don't want you touching me. I don't want you in the secret places that I hide. I don't want you knowing what's deep in my heart. I don't want you knowing all those secret sins. But I'll come to your church because it's a nice place and I can make friends. That's not being part of him. See, when Jesus says, I want you to be part of me, he says, we're going to know each other all the way through. You're going to know me right down to my blood and I'm going to know every sin you've ever committed. And I'm going to take it, and I'm going to cleanse it, and I'm going to make you clean. Because it is this washing of feet, this washing that makes it so important. And we understand what this is all about. Peter's response is, well, don't just wash my feet, wash all of me. And Jesus says, no, it's not about taking a bath. It's not about personal hygiene. It's just realizing where the dirt is because the dirtiest person can have a clean soul and the person who looks the best and is just bathed can be completely full of sin and he needs to be cleansed because he has not allowed Jesus to cleanse him no matter how big the mess is Jesus can cleanse it and I think that's what he's trying to get across Jesus can cleanse it no matter how big of of a mess we get ourselves into no matter, and I can just imagine it was raining that day and you know what happens when it's raining and you know the water's up to here I remember seeing a cartoon the water's this deep and the kids walking along going I'm sure glad I wore my boots <laughs> there's nothing you can do to help the situation that's going to make it any better but there is a whole lot Jesus does to be able to make the situation incredibly better the other part of this is when Jesus knew. Whenever we're reluctant or insecure, we tend not to be sure about our relationship. But when Jesus knew where he was going, where he came from, all things are in his authority. And I think that's true for us. When we know we are able to share Jesus, we're able to share this cleansing that he talks about. And that's really what he's doing here. When we know the sacrifice of Jesus and that he died on the cross for our sins, we're able to share that. When we know his mercy in our life because we've received mercy, we're able to share that cleansing. When we know we've been forgiven, when we know what clean means, when we know what redeemed means, then we are able to share that with other people. When we know what it's like to be holy, then we're able to share that. And then we can wash feet. We can reach to people and be Jesus to them, offering to wash them. And if they are willing, Jesus is the one who cleanses. And Jesus is part of that. And Jesus used this idea of washing feet to be part of him. We use 
this because he explains later he left us baptism to show to be part of him. He left us worship to be able to be part of him. He left us prayer to be able to be part of him. But the cleansing comes first. That's the most important because then it puts us into the relationship where all these other things make sense. So what would you share about Jesus? You see, what it does is it makes it very, very personal. It, because this is your feet, right? Does it make you weird when somebody says, oh, let me see your feet? Oh, look at my feet. Don't they look good? That's why we keep our shoes on. Well, not so much in Arizona. We wear flip-flops all the time, right? So, I mean, feet are just out there. But those, can, those tend to be more personal. We really don't want anybody washing those. Uh, so sometimes we get the idea that what we share is, well, I'll invite them to come to church. And that'll be my part. Because I'll invite them to come to church, and then they can talk to somebody that really knows about Jesus. And it doesn't work. And we're shocked and we go, well, why not? Because they were interested in your Jesus. They were interested in your relationship with Jesus and what you know about Jesus. And yeah, they might come to somebody else, but that's only if they're very, very interested. But they want to know you, want to know what you see, what you share. And that's really the commission that Jesus gave to all of us is to be able to go and share the things that we know about Jesus, what Jesus is to us, to share our story about Jesus. They want to know what we believe. And so what Jesus would you share? I think probably the first one is Jesus in my distress, in my problem, in my things that go wrong. Jesus is the one who answers prayer. Jesus is the one who responds and fulfills wishes. We lay down heavy burdens, right? Come to me who are weary and heavy laden. Take up my yoke. And that's the Jesus we want to share because he's the one who lifts heavy burdens from people when they get caught so much in this world of sin and so much in this world of suffering. They go to Jesus and to his suffering. Because it says, I suffered like that so that you would be able to know this. And he is able to come to our aid because he suffered. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 says, But we do not see Jesus who is made a lower than angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory and daughters, sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. And so he says, so we do see Jesus. We see Jesus as the one who suffers. We see him made lower than angels for a little while, not for a long time, but for a little while while he was here on earth, now crowned with glory and honor because he's risen, gone back there. By grace, he died on a cross so that he might taste death for everyone, as this passage described. He brings us to glory, and that's what people want to know. It's what glory you have. They want to be able to know how you got that. Jesus perfects and is perfected through suffering. That's not easy, but that's what it's all about. That's what redemption is. He took our place. He suffered for us. And so that's one of the things that Jesus has done, and that's one he one of the things that we want to share first if they want to know how Jesus relieves suffering he does it by taking it and saying I'll do it for you it's one of those amazing things that Jesus is able to do Hebrews 5 8 for even though Jesus was God's son he learned obedience from things he suffered and so do we we learn obedience from things we suffer 
He talks here about family also. Family is the one who kind of takes care of each other, right? I mean, they may argue or they may fight, but they're going to take care of each other. They're going to suffer for each other. Because as soon as one of them has a problem, all of them have the same problem. If one of them is sick, all of them have to join in together. And so family is like that. Parents give up things for kids in order to make their family what it should be. And they suffer for each other. They identify with each other. They do things together. And Jesus' family is one that meant holy. It's one that meant forgiven. It's one that meant redeemed. And so his family looks like that. Other families might be football families, for example, where everybody plays football or tennis families or something like this. We're the family of God. But have you ever seen a family like that? Let me just illustrate for a minute where every person in the family is somehow part of football. The dad used to play. The kids are going to play. Mom's going to be the cheerleader or was or is. Sisters are also there cheering on the sideline. Everything about that family is focused on football. Now let me just say if that's your family, you ought to be able to share Jesus. Absolutely. Because you've picked something where you say to your kids, all right, here's what I want you to do. We're going to get all these pads on you and send you out, and you're going to run down the field, and somebody is going to run at you at full speed and knock the stuffing out of you. And this is fun. (laughs) If you can sell that, you can sell Jesus easy. I mean, but there are so many people who are into things like that. Why? Why would any kid ever believe this or think this is fun? Because my dad believes it. Because somebody else has done it. Because of their experience and they told me the story about this great touchdown. And it made them proud. And I want to make them proud. It's a story of glory. It's a story of their passion. It's a story of what they believe. And Jesus is no different. Jesus is a story about what God does in our life. And you can just imagine as they're running and and they're about to collide at each other going, yeah, this is fun. This is because it is. You know why? They believe it. How can you take something that is suffering and tell the world, this is great. Come to our place where we suffer and talk about suffering. And we have a guy who suffered for us, and it's always wonderful. Maybe hard to explain, but it's about explaining the passion. It's about explaining what you believe and what you want and what you do. And when you believe, they will believe as well, because they will understand what it's all about. Maybe we want to share the Jesus that is crazy. You ever think about it that way? The Jesus that just seems insane. I mean, he just does not seem like this is right at all. He says things like, love your enemies. Really? Love your enemies? Are you kidding me? Who's going to do that? We want to love enemies. He seems like he's not even dealing with the right things because of the things he does. He's the terrifying Jesus. He expects us not to live in this world, but in his world. He expects us to care for poor and helpless. He expects us to do all kinds of things that he would, he even talks to dead people. Did you realize that? I mean, Moses and Eliza, he steps across the line into heaven and then comes back and You know, fortunately, as they're coming down from the mountain of transfiguration, he says, now don't tell anybody. And, of course, their response is, and don't worry. Why would we? Who's going to explain that? I mean, this has got to be crazy to be able to believe in a guy who does all these strange things like this. And as you look at Scripture, there's a lot of strange things like this. He even walks on water. Matthew 14, 
he had stayed back with the crowd after feeding the 5,000, and he stayed behind to pray, and he had prayed most of the night, and a storm had come up, the disciples are in the boat trying to go across, and it's the fourth watch, which means from 3 or 4 a.m. on to morning, and so Jesus comes, he says, no, I don't need a boat, I'll just walk. And he's walking across on the water. The storm is bad. The seas are bad. And the disciples see him and they scream like little girls. That's part of the Greek. It's not really in the text. But <laughs> you understand it says, and they were very afraid. That's what that means. Uh, and so he decides, I've got to stop. And I've got to be able to deal with this. So he says, don't worry, it's I. Of course, that makes you not worry. And Peter says, well, if it's you, then tell me to come walk out. And he says, okay, sure, come on. You believe this guy? This is crazy, Jesus. And you want to share him? But sure enough, Peter comes walking out on the water and comes toward Jesus. Jesus is not walking toward him. And then Peter sees the storm and sees the waves and realizes how far he is from the boat. And I think maybe it's really dependent on how far we are from the boat. And once you're past your swim level, you would decide, I'm not going to make it back. And he cries for help as he sinks. And Jesus is amazed and upset. Why did you doubt He expects way too much, doesn't he? You want to share crazy Jesus? The one who expects so much? This is a terrifying Jesus. How could anyone expect us to live like that? To do those kind of things? It's really hard to explain what Jesus does for us. That he's terrifying and great all at the same time. Because you realize Peter walked on water. He also sank and drowned, but, you know, but he walked on water. It's like making it almost across the Grand Canyon. No, that's not a good thing. People won't understand what draws you to something that is uncomfortable unless you can explain how it feels. Does that make sense? My example is camping. How many of you like to go camping? Oh, good. <laughs> Maybe some people will understand this. Camping is great, right? You get to go out to a place that hopefully has no cell phone service and uh, be away from everything. This is our last trip. It's beautiful out there. You pick a place to go to that's beautiful. And you stuff everything you possibly can into the back of your Subaru. By the way, have a Subaru. <laughs> so that you can carry this out and be away from all of the conveniences like heating or air conditioning or things like that. Stoves, microwaves, everything. And you've made this incredibly difficult for you. So you're going out, you're driving to a spot, you have to set up your own shelter, you have to carry your own food, you have to cook your own food, you, and people want to do this? Really? Yes. Why would you do something that makes you so uncomfortable? Well, because when you get out there, it's really quiet. I mean, part of the reason is the s'mores at night, right? I mean, you got to have s'mores. But part of it is just that experience of being out, and there's a quiet like nothing else. You can't get it in your backyard. And it's a quiet and a peacefulness and really a time when you can get closer to God if you're paying attention because you realize he made everything around you. He made it to look beautiful like this. He made all of these things. And you realize that he's the one and you're closer than ever. People have asked me this and I've tried to analyze why I like it so much. I think it's because you're closer to survival. 
I'm not sure if you like survival mode or not, but that's really what it is. You're putting up your own tent, you're making your own food, and you're doing really basic things like food and shelter. And it brings you closer to feeling alive than anything else. You don't feel alive like that sitting in front of your TV with a remote in your hand flipping channels. When you can sit out in the middle of that, that's a whole new place to enjoy. It's beautiful. It's simple. You leave all the stress behind. You get up in the morning and you make breakfast. It's a great place just to be able to relax, just to be able to enjoy. It's like you stepped in another world. And actually, you're 20 minutes from town. <laughs> Why would we like that? If you can explain that, you can explain Jesus. Because it's what it does to your soul. It's what it feels like. And that's what you need to explain about Jesus. Not just all the facts and all the doctrine, but how it feels to be at peace how it feels to have the joy of Christ and what it means to be holy it's kind of like fishing for men if you like fishing you want to catch fish that are messy and that stink and you have to clean and all of this stuff it's kind of like catching men because their lives are messy and it's pretty tough and it's probably messier than fish and some of it stinks and and then Jesus brings redemption. And Jesus brings his peace. And Jesus brings his joy. And it's a whole new world for them. And it's different than it was 20 minutes ago. Because he's changed their life. So we wait for the right time when we can try to explain all of this to them. Because if you catch the wrong time, they'll never get it. Because this is what you're trying to explain. It's not just the facts, but to share about the change. What change occurs to you when you go through these things, whether it's football or camping or fishing or whatever it is. Share the change in your life about what that means. Steve read a passage to us earlier that I wanted to talk about again. We looked at it a little bit last week. There's a guy who's a demoniac. He's possessed by all kinds of demons. He had been in the tombs he's naked he's crazy and he's in agony he's cutting himself with rocks and it's just a, a crazy world that he lives in because he's been possessed by evil his world is crazy it's filled with evil it's in the middle of civilization but it's in the middle of a civilization of people that don't want Jesus and people that don't want him once he's been healed and people are upset about the economy because all the pigs died and they can't accept him being normal. And so now what's he supposed to do? And his idea is I'm going to go with Jesus. And so at the end of Mark 5 and verse 18 it says, And Jesus was getting into the boat. The man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him. And Jesus did not let him but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. And the man went again away and began to tell in Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And the last line is, and all the people were amazed. What are they amazed at? They're amazed at looking at a normal guy right? I'm back to normal. I've got clothes on. Yeah, you're not so impressive anymore. We could sell tickets to what you were before. I mean, the crazy guy in the tombs, come see that. We're the only town with one. I mean, it could be a tourist attraction, right? But how can you be the attraction that amazes everybody when all you've done is get your life straightened out? Because when they hear the story of what it took to straighten out your life and the fact that you have been where you've been to and now sit here clothed and sane at the feet of Jesus, goodness, what power. 
That's what people need to hear. That's the rest of the story. That's the passion you need to share. What God has done for you. How Jesus suffered for you. And now you found rest. How it scares you sometimes to think about the things that Jesus asked, like loving enemies and catching men. And you have stories of answered prayers, right? Just like Jairus. When he came and asked, you have those stories. The times of cleansing and how it feels to be clean. Everyone remembers the moment right after their baptism. Everyone because it is a life-changing event. If you don't remember, then maybe you need to try it. Because everyone does. And the times of cleansing and what that means, how you can find the peace and love and joy and how the Holy Spirit fills your life and how he gives you power in your life and how he's the one who maybe could even make you walk on water. But you know what? Would you convince anyone if you did? Would it make a difference? I saw this. Haters will see you walk on water and say it's because you can't swim. (laughs) Some people are not going to get it. But some people, when they hear about the passion, when they hear about the experience, when they hear what's personal, it'll change them also. And that's sharing Jesus. So maybe you struggle with this. I think a lot of us struggle with this. How do we share this? Tell me the doctrine. Tell me the points. Let me get scriptures and number them so that I can, you know, go from one to one to one. So this week, here's your assignment. Write it all down. Okay? All the times when prayers were answered. Tell about your conversion about what that felt like, why you did it. Tell about why you sit here this morning worshiping God who suffered for you. Tell about why you give on Mission Sunday or any other Sunday. Tell about what it feels like for God to bless you, what it feels like to be part of a great church, what it feels like when all of God's people are working together. And if you don't know that one, show up next Saturday for Turkey Pantry. We serve a hundred turkey dinners in about two hours. It is mad chaos and one of the greatest, most fun things. You know, we talked about an uncomfortable thing. Yeah, come be part of the fury. It is amazing. It's amazing to see a church. So explain that. Here's what it means to be part of a church. Here's what it means for what Jesus has done in my life. And they will believe what you believe because you believe it. And that's why Jesus made disciples and sent them out. If you don't know that already, maybe that's why you're here this morning. And maybe that's why you need to come and realize there's people sitting all around you with these stories of what Jesus has done. Just short of walking on water, they can tell you about all of this. If you don't know him, come be part of him. Come while we stand and sit.